Hi. The last two years of the COVID pandemic have cast an enduring scar across humanity, one that will be impossible to delete. It wouldn't be exaggeration to say that COVID has been the defining global emergency of our eras. Here is a virus that has shut down the world, closed down our cities, derailed our economies, and uh, in the course of two years, killed six million people and counting. Uh, we now talk of COVID going into an endemic phase, but uh, TB is a disease that uh, we've always considered endemic, one that has been there since the dawn of civilization. And uh, the impact of these two ongoing uh, syndemics, if I may put it that way, will be fascinating to, to understand as the decade ahead unfolds. So I never thought I would see a more deadly disease than MDR-TB in my lifetime, for example, one, an airborne disease that's more deadly. But the impact of this novel virus on this ancient bacterial disease has truly been devastating. Just as another virus HIV did to TB control three decades ago, the effect of SARS is almost certainly going to set back TB control several years. And what are the interactions, the synergies, and the impact when these two airborne diseases collide? As I said, one tuberculosis as old as human civilization, and the other which was unknown till two years ago. And how do high burden countries best equip themselves to navigate the tortuous path between controlling COVID without at the same time neglecting tuberculosis. And uh, that is uh, uh, the additional impact of this virus on this disease, which has always been there because we've had billions exposed to TB, 2 billion who have TB infection, 10 million with TB disease per year, and TB still kills 1.5 million deaths per year. So when we talk about COVID becoming endemic, let's hope it doesn't become endemic like tuberculosis, which still kills uh, uh, with remarkable regularity. And tuberculosis had long been the world's leading infectious killer, but that dubious title on April 1st, 2020, went to COVID, when the daily death count from COVID outnumbered TB deaths at this stage. Uh, on April 1st, it overtook TB as the infectious disease killing the most people per day. And two years into the pandemic, where are we? Uh, 400 million cases and counting of COVID, which almost dwarfs the uh, TB wheel uh, into submission. But it is this overlap of these two diseases and the indirect effects as well of COVID on tuberculosis that we will be discussing here. So how is COVID impacting on TB? There have been delays in the diagnosis of new TB cases and much less active case finding. And that holds true for the developed and developing world. There's been a disruption to medical production, transportation and supply. There have been great stockouts in delays in accessing both first and second line drugs. I'm talking especially of the early days of the pandemic. Uh, there's less staffing and therefore reduced care because most staff was purloined over from TB to COVID care. There's reduced support for the dreadful adverse effects and the comorbidities that can occur because of tuberculosis, delays in our patients receiving the financial and nutritional support packages, which are their rights, uh, great shortfalls in BCG vaccine, and I've got a couple of slides discussing that a little later, and interruptions in HIV and TB HIV programs as well. So are patients with TB more prone to get COVID and do they have worse outcomes from it? The verdict is not yet clear on these two very, very important questions. But most people feel that infection with TB is a more common comorbidity for COVID than the traditional ones like diabetes and obesity, hypertension, ischemic heart disease and COPD. And in this study, in the early days from out of Wuhan, sorry, uh, MTB infection was linked 
to the patient then getting more severe COVID, that COVID progressing more rapidly, poorer outcomes in dually infected patients. And they also wondered if latent TB infection would be an independent risk factor for susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. And if that were true, billions of people would be more prone. And we just don't have the answers to this. Time will tell us. Uh, what about TB HIV, TB HIV and COVID? Well, TB with or without HIV was recognized as a risk factor, as I told you, for COVID-19. Patients with TB having more severe COVID in this study, higher mortalities from COVID, and the HIV infection were particularly vulnerable. So TB, HIV, COVID probably is the worst outcome, even more than TB COVID. And these diseases are so similar. As someone wise put it, COVID is like a version of tuberculosis on steroids. They share biosocial determinants, the four commonest being for TB, poverty, overcrowding, pollution, and diabetes. And check this list. They are also the most common four biodeterminants of COVID. And I've put that up here in a slide from a, from a paper we wrote a couple of years ago. And we called it the poverty trap. The social economic consequences of COVID will increase the number of people living in poverty by half a billion. Look, COVID has resulted in the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. It's estimated that the poorest 20% of the population of this world will take a decade to, effect, uh, to recover from the effects of COVID. They've been pushed below the poverty line. And as a result, this new poor are certainly going to be more vulnerable to TB because we know TB and malnutrition are potent risk factors for tuberculosis developing. So poverty and the impact of COVID will push an additional 104 million below the poverty line, increasing their vulnerability in turn to tuberculosis. And then there are the effects of the lockdown. Uh, Jayati Ghosh from New Delhi called this, said this was the most, the most destructive effects of COVID have not been the results of the disease, but the nature of our response. The most stringent lockdown in the world destroyed the economy forced millions into poverty and hunger, but did little to control viral transmission. And I wish we had had this, this paper has just come out January, 2022 from the Johns Hopkins group. And I wish we had this knowledge two years ago, precisely when we chose one of the most rigorous lockdowns in the world, the longest lasting two, uh, because they looked, these authors looked at the effects of lockdowns across the globe. And they showed us three important facts, that lockdowns have little or no public health effect, that they pose enormous economic and social costs where they are adopted. And they conclude by saying lockdowns are ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. As I said, I wish we had the power of hindsight. And how did our lockdown impact our TB patients? It changed their health-seeking behavior. You're, take your mind back to the early days of the pandemic. People were too scared to leave their houses. And even if they had dared to venture out, there was no public transport and they would have been turned back. It disrupted all health services, qualitatively and quantitatively. It delayed the diagnosis, therefore, and the notification of tuberculosis. There was less testing. Where are all our gene expert machines being put to use at present? They're being put to use for COVID tests because the gene expert machine is a ideal way to give a quick diagnosis of COVID as ideal as it is to give us a quick diagnosis of tuberculosis. Treatment interruptions occurred for the reasons I talked about, medical supplies, drug stockouts, interrupted treatment. And we know that TB is one disease which does not bear any interruption. All this could certainly have amplified drug resistance, irregular treatments, delays in treatment, as you know, and uh, increased transmission at home was probably occurring while our patients were too scared to leave and uh, exit their houses. Uh, perhaps the only good thing that lockdown did was that mask wearing increased <clears throat> and perhaps uh, mask wearing was destigmatized. So that is the only positive effect I can see from the lockdown. Perhaps, therefore, there was reduced community transmission of tuberculosis just because patients were at home in, in, too scared to leave the house. And when they did, they generally wore masks. <clears throat> 
But look at this precipitous drop in BCG vaccination rates. In March 2020, 260,000 fewer kids received BCG than in January 2020. And in April 2020, 1 million fewer children were vaccinated than the corresponding figure one year ago. That's frightening. So all this will come back probably to haunt us years and perhaps decades down the line. Notifications of TB cases dropped. These cases were always there, but they just dropped below the radar. TB notification rates in August 2020, for example, were 50% lower than one year earlier. Notifications drop sharply in both the public and the private sector. And the causes of this are obvious. They are patient related and program related, as I've put up in this slide. And you can see with the onset of the lockdown how there was this sharp drop in the public and the private sector in terms of TB notification cases. The cases were always there, of course. They were just not being notified. They dropped below the radar. And uh, this is from the latest WHO chart, which showed and compared TB notifications between 19 and 20. The monthly notification cases in 20 were 30% lower in India. 30% reduction in notification equals 3 million more people dying from tuberculosis. Treatment completion rates fell and DOTS completion rates fell by 23,000 patients from Jan to April 2020, as you can see in this graph. And that is the TB report I made reference to. And they conclude that the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to leave a profound and long lasting impact on TB diagnosis and control, leading to an additional 6.3 million cases of TB globally and an additional 1.4 million TB deaths between the next four or five years. And we were part of this study uh, in the CDC journal and we just showed that at the Hinduja Hospital, a very, very busy tertiary care center, uh, our OPD TB visits just dropped by two thirds and our inpatients fell by two thirds when we compared them to their 2019 levels. So patients were obviously paying a price. And this aftershock will be felt over time. And these are projections by a colleague and friend uh, called Nim at the Imperial uh, Institute in the UK. And he, 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 he guessed that each month of lockdown in India would result in an additional 40,000 TB cases annually for the next five years, and a total of 151,000 plus cases. That's 5.7% increase in TB deaths in India. And when I say guess, this was based on very, very careful mathematical modeling. Uh, what did we do? Well, we did our bit. We used telemedicine. Again, one of the possible fringe benefits of the lockdown. We use telemedicine to the benefit of our patients. Each crisis is really an opportunity in disguise, isn't it? And uh, this was published in Lung India, where we use telemedicine to reach out to a cohort of the most difficult, most drug-resistant XDRTB patients we had on precious bedaquiline. We did not want to let them lapse. We did not want them to not take their drugs for any reason. And we managed this cohort, thanks mainly to one of my, one of my very competent registrars, uh, Samridhi Sharma. We managed this cohort of 30 patients remotely through the lockdown with regular teleconsults. And we kept questioning them about new complaints, drug reactions, adherence, bedaquiline, Directions were given, ECG monitoring was done, prescriptions were given. It is possible to do all these things online, as we've all now discovered. And after remote management like we did through the lockdown, I was chagrined to find that 68% when we polled them later said they preferred the convenience of telemedicine to direct contact. Driving through three hours of Bombay's traffic to reach Dr. Udwadia, who has a minute or two, unfortunately, only to spare uh, perhaps this was more convenient. And uh, of course, 27% still preferred a direct interaction face to face across a table and 5% they said they had no particular preference. And I think these are my last couple of sides. And I've put up provocatively, what if we tackle TB like we have tackled COVID uh, over the last two years? Uh, with the considerable overlap between these diseases, what if we merged 
the detection, the contact tracing, and the infection control programs. We destigmatize mass. We had bi-directional screening and active case finding. We leveraged all the community care work workers currently searching for COVID cases to consolidate and complement active TB case finding. We've often talked about active TB case finding, going out and finding your tuberculosis cases in the community. But uh, we've never really got around to doing it. Perhaps we could. Uh, what about integrating the use of testing platforms? And I've given you an example with the gene expert platform. And most important, speeding up the new drugs and the vaccine trials. We've seen this abundance, this profusion of TB drugs, which have come out, sorry, of COVID drugs, I beg your pardon, uh, which have come out over the last two years only. And yet the TB drug uh, pipeline has been so glacial in its progress. Look, for TB, we have a single old dinosaur of a vaccine, which is over a century old. While with COVID, we have an abundance. We have 33 approved vaccines as of today being used across the globe for COVID. 10 have got WHO approval. 197 countries have approved vaccines. And uh, there are so many further vaccine trials, vaccine candidates, and countries where vaccine trials are taking place. And on the TB side of the balance, we have just one old vaccine whose, uh, whose efficacy has always been questionable. So let me end with this quote, lest we forget COVID-19 is a wake up call to a health system. And she's talking of TB that was already underfunded, overburdened, poorly staffed, wasteful, and provided care of questionable quality. Without a robust and responsive health system, we can neither hope to eliminate TB nor weather the COVID-19 storm. And I couldn't hope to end uh, on a better note than uh, this quote from Lucicia Dittu, the director of Stop TB. Thank you.